We welcome you back to the final segment of the program, the Anka Leg with the Hall of Famer, Matt Miller, and the tallest coast we've ever had, John Bondwell. Tips the uh, height uh, tracker at six feet, seven inches tall. John, have you grown or are you shrinking now? I'm shrinking. Oh. I'm well, definitely. Uh, you got height to give, though. I, I do, unlike height, who has no height to give. Oddly <laughs> enough, the man named height doesn't have any height, right? That's, uh, there's quite a, I, it's, it's irony, I believe, is what they would. That's the thing about irony. It's so ironic. Yes, right. yes. This segment of our program today brought to you by L.A. Roberts Jewelers in downtown Martinsburg, where you can get that special someone, that special something. And Orsini's Home Store, not just an appliance store any longer, though they do have great appliances and uh, service, too, at Orsini's. And you can find out more at Orsini's.com. Via telephone, he is the speaker pro tem, Delegate Paul Espinosa, former chair of the Education Committee. He also sits on finance. Paul, good morning to you. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, Mac. Good morning, Jonathan. Good to be with you this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Did you tell uh, household of the Wally Pip story there, Paul, since uh, he's getting you to sub for him today? Uh, no, I, <laughs> I'm not familiar with that story. Wally, yes. <laughs> yes. So Lou, Lou Gehrig, uh, one day, hanging out in the dugout, gets the call from his manager that uh, Wally Pip's not feeling so good. Why don't you go in and play first base? And Lou didn't come out for the next 2,130 games. <laughs> Wally Pip didn't have a job anymore. You tell that house well, owner that can happen. <laughs> yeah, don't get a cold. You can get Wally Pipped. No, I think uh, I, I think a leader householder's uh, job is secure. He's uh, he's obviously doing a great job leading our caucus, and uh, so happy to pinch hit for him, though. The inside joke on that is that uh, Eric had been scheduled for about a week in this segment. He texted me this morning and said, hey, I am swamped. Can we uh, get somebody to do the segment for me? And I said, you know, you probably have more access to people right now in Charleston than I do. Why don't you uh, look into this? So uh, Paul, gracious enough to fill in and also because of his knowledge on the Finance Committee of the state's revenues, eminently qualified to talk about the January revenue surplus, which was $52 million, bringing the state's year-to-date total of over $450 million in excess of projections. Paul, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, you know, we just continue to uh, show uh, really good uh, um, positive economic results. And and, and that's in, in, in spite of the fact, or perhaps I think some of us would point to uh, the economic growth that's being spurred by the um, historic tax cuts that we implemented, uh, even though we uh, uh, implemented a 21.5% a personal income tax reduction that was retroactive to January 1st of 2023, you know, we're still, if you look at our uh, personal income uh, tax um, collections, you know, we're still um, for, you know, year to date, I think we're only down about 5% in personal income tax receipts uh, year over year. So I think that indicates or just gives some indication that despite the fact that we were able to implement such a large uh, uh, tax reduction, tax relief for West Virginia taxpayers, uh, the economic growth that we're seeing um, is almost enough to, uh, uh, not quite, but almost enough to offset that, that tax relief. So really good news. Were there any concerns with the numbers that came came in, Paul. Yeah, I was just looking through the numbers. And again, um, uh, Eric knows uh, these numbers, you know, like the back of his hand. But uh, I know um, uh, as far as the uh, uh, sales and use tax, uh, I think that was down just a little bit. Uh, it was, um, uh, I think, down about $412,000 uh, for the month. But uh, if you look at uh, the sales and use tax, uh, year to date, uh, we're still in pretty good shape there, actually up 4% uh, year over year. Severance taxes uh, continue to be kind of anemic, but, you know, that's due uh, to, uh, you know, the historically low energy prices or relatively historic uh, uh, low energy prices. And the fact that, you know, we're looking out uh, today, I, I think the forecast here is about 54 degrees uh, here in early February, and I suspect probably a similar, uh, similarly mild uh, day uh, there 
there in the panhandle. And, and, you know, for the most part, I think we've been seeing that, uh, you know, across uh, West Virginia and across the country. And so that certainly does impact those severance taxes. But I think the good news is, is that we have tried to be very conservative with our severance tax estimates. And, uh, for example, with the uh, trigger that's in place that could perhaps lead to an additional up to 10 percent reduction in personal income tax reduction, depending on how we finish the current fiscal year that runs through June 30th, we intentionally, you know, kept severance taxes out of the mix. You know, we didn't want to rely on revenues that, you know, are kind of cyclical, just depending on, you know, factors such as uh, weather and uh, and just global energy prices. So aside from that, I think a pretty good shape across the board. I'm told by others I've interviewed regarding this topic who have been on finance committees or been chairs or vice chairs of finance and such that consumer sales and use tax is one they particularly pay attention to along with the personal income tax because if people are spending money, then you know the consumer sales taxes will be up. If they are not, uh, that uh, figure obviously will be down, then it's a signal of uh, some greater issues that are going on with the state's economy. And this was up. And in fact, it exceeded by uh, $20 million, $20.6 million uh, for the estimate, Paul, which is a great sign, is it not? Well, I think, again, it just shows some of the optimism, uh, you know, that folks are seeing. And, you know, I, I think when you have more money in your pocket, and again, uh, uh, 21 and, and, and um, I guess it was a quarter percent uh, personal income tax reduction. Uh, I mean, that's real money that's in uh, uh, people's pockets. And you look ahead to this next uh, year, uh, uh, those uh, personal property taxes paid on vehicles, uh, you, you know, you and your listeners are well aware that my and, and many of my colleagues' preferred approach would, would have been to totally eliminate that uh, tax on personal uh, property, uh, your, your personal vehicle uh, taxes. But uh, with the failure of Amendment 2, uh, we uh, uh, opted to uh, take the governor up on his suggestion and uh, have implemented a fully refundable tax credit. So any of those taxes uh, that are paid for vehicle taxes you know, for uh, this uh, fiscal year uh, will be fully refundable when folks file their, I guess that'll be their uh, their next year, um, their, their 2025, uh, their next year when they file their um, state tax return, that will be a fully refundable tax credit. So I think all that just adds up to more money, more disposable income in folks' pockets so that they can decide, you know, how they want to uh, spend that for, for their and their family's benefit. Matt Miller. Paul, when you look at the the surplus that's going on right now, is this generally a slow time when it comes to uh, those revenue projections? You know, we, we, I think of, of business as a whole coming out of December and a lot of spending with the Christmas holiday and so forth. January, February may tend to be a little bit softer months. Does that work the same when it comes to that tax revenue? I, I think that's right, uh, Matt. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not quite as well versed on the, you know, the timing of some of these issues. Obviously, as we get closer to tax filing time, uh, we'll start to see a bump up in our personal income tax collections because of, you know, uh, you know, uh, folks uh, filing their their returns. Uh, so uh, I think there's you know certainly some cyclical nature to those tax receipts, uh, but. Uh, Again, I'd probably defer to uh, to Leader Householder and uh, and even President Blair, who of course served uh, for many years as our Senate Finance Chair, who probably know those uh, those uh, you know cycles uh, better than I do. Is everything still in place as far as a, a certain percentage of surplus that is required to go into the rainy day fund or as as full as we have been able to get our rainy day fund? Are we at a point where uh, maybe a little less is going into that fund and more can be used elsewhere? Well, we do enjoy a very healthy um uh, rainy day funds. We actually have two separate rainy day funds, but together, I think the um, the most recent uh, figure as of January 31st, or 31st rather, uh, was a little over 1.2 billion dollars. And uh, 
typically the rated agencies that uh, look at the fiscal health of a state, they really look at, you know, what are your rainy day uh, account balances in relation or as a ratio to your um, general revenue budget. So this year, I, I think as enacted, I think we had a $4.7 billion general revenue budget that we have now. So you're literally looking at uh, probably you know, uh, somewhere in the range of, you know, a 20 to 25 percent uh, uh, general or uh, uh, re revenue uh, surplus, a, a, a rainy day account uh, balance, which, again, is actually one of the healthiest rainy day accounts in, in the country. Now, that said, I think most folks will, will say or, or will believe or do believe, and I think the rated agencies uh, often uh, you know, reinforce the fact that because we are an energy state and we do, uh, while we have been very successful in, in, uh, in, in diversifying our economy, still the energy sector does make up a, 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 a significant portion of our budget. And so for that reason, uh, we need to have a healthy rainy day uh, fund so that when there are downturns in the energy economy and severance taxes, uh, you know, take a dip, you know, that we do have uh, rainy day funds that, you know, could act to um, – you know, offset any downturns in expected revenue, but doesn't seem like that's uh, you know any uh, in, in, that there's a likelihood of that anytime soon. And again, I, I really applaud our our, our uh, finance chairs uh, in the in the governor's office, uh, the, the revenue uh, folks there that have taken a very very cautious approach, so that you know the tax relief that we've enacted you know can continue and hopefully increase uh, here in the coming years without, uh, you know, a, a danger of having to reverse any of that tax relief. Speaker Pro Tem, Delegate Paul Espinosa, our guest on the program. Uh, Paul, if we could talk about some of your bills. Uh, we just had a discussion with Principal Maria Bird from St. Joe's with the collapse of St. Maria Goretti as the lone Catholic high school in the region. St. Joe's is looking into expanding and perhaps adding uh, ninth through 12th grades eventually. And Principal Bird was talking about the importance of the Hope Scholarship and helping parents with tuition because they're trying to keep a tuition line somewhere around $10,000 if they ended up uh, getting a high school level. And the Hope Scholarship could effectively provide half of that, uh, that being the case. HB 4945 is a, a bill you have uh, helped sponsor relating generally to the Hope Scholarship program. What changes are you looking to make for that program, Paul? Well, I was uh, certainly happy to uh, sponsor and work for the enactment of the initial uh, enabling legislation that created the Hope Scholarship and uh, House Bill 4945 essentially is a uh, is a technical cleanup uh, bill of sorts. Uh, 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 first, I'd, I'd like to commend the Treasurer's Office under uh, Raleigh Moore's uh, leadership for implementing the uh, Hope Scholarship. Uh, they are the agency that actually administers the program, and I just think they've done an excellent job of, of, of doing so. But uh, just in in uh, in talking with the, with uh, Raleigh and, and his staff, uh, uh, it was clear that there are a few little minor things that need to be addressed. Uh, things that uh, you know, quite frankly, you know, when you're crafting a, a, pr a new program like the Hope Scholarship, uh, just some things are just really not known. And so, uh, probably the most substantive change that uh, that uh, my legislation would would uh, change is just the way that the treasurer's office budgets for the program. Uh, we are seeing a growth uh, in the program uh, year over year is uh, you have uh, you know, new kindergarten classes that begin to be eligible each year, each and every year for the program. And under current law, uh, the treasurer's office has to submit uh, an estimate of participation based on last year's enrollment. Well, you know, that's fine when you have a relatively steady program, but would you, when you have a, a growing program like the Hope Scholarship uh, is experiencing, you automatically face a situation where the required uh, uh, estimate or budget uh, request that the Treasurer's Office is requesting is almost certainly going to be less than what is actually needed. Well, 
uh, both the uh, House and the Senate. Uh, you know, certainly they've understood that, and each year uh, it has been more than willing, if necessary, to pass supplemental appropriations to make up for that gap. Uh, House Bill 4945 would allow the Treasurer's Office to provide an estimate on December 10th of each year, which is closer to you know, the upcoming uh, school year. And as a result, that uh, we believe will make that uh, uh, estimate you know, much, much closer to what the actual funding need is. So again, it just kind of uh, helps ensure that we're dealing with the most accurate numbers, the most accurate estimates that we can, so that yeah, it, uh, we don't see the necessity of going in and making up for what we knew when 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 it was submitted, uh, lower uh, than the necessary uh, appropriation. Uh, the other things uh, really truly are just kind of technical in nature, just making it very clear that the program is intended to be a K through 12 program. Uh, there was the question as to well, what happens if there are funds left over after someone can you know completes their their uh, their work uh, you know, in uh, in high school, you know what happens to those funds, and we just wanted to make very clear that while certainly this program, the Hope Scholarship. Uh, uh, does uh, provide for dual enrollment if someone wants to be dual enrolled just uh, as a traditional high school student uh, might uh, be dual enrolled in in uh, uh, post secondary education uh, makes it very clear that it is a uh, intended to be a k through twelve program so those type of things and very pleased that it did pass out of uh, house education uh, i think without uh, without amendment uh, a strong support there it 's now before uh, house finance committee and we'll anticipate that as we start to uh, run bills now that we've uh, we're nearing completion of our budget hearings that typically dominate the first half of the uh, legislative session uh, certainly hopeful that uh, chairman Chris will get that on the agenda and again it will just uh, it'll just uh, address some of those issues that the treasurer's also have brought to our attention that will just ensure that uh, the program is user friendly do want to just add uh, just uh, as a follow-up to your previous guest uh, you know I, I think what we're seeing uh, while certainly uh, you know lament the demise of uh, St. Maria Goretti. I think what we're seeing uh, in in the case of St. Joe's uh, contemplating uh, uh, offering uh, some some high school uh, age classes, I think you're starting to see exactly what we anticipated with the Hope Scholarship. That uh, now that there are uh, you know there are funds available to uh, families that uh, perhaps could not afford that previously, you're going to start seeing more and more vendors, more and more education providers locate and develop here in West Virginia, uh, while certainly you know, there's always going to be uh, you know, a relatively small percentage of folks that may take advantage of services just across the border because we are in a regional kind of a border economy. Uh, I think you're going to see more and more education providers uh, established here in uh, West Virginia to uh, to uh, you know, fill a growing uh, desire for uh, some additional uh, student-centered services. Paul, I got a couple of quick questions for you. Um, number one, is there anything uh, in the program with an uptick for inflation, um, where if inflation hits a certain amount, you mean with the Hope Scholarship, the Hope Scholarship gets larger? Um, and then I've got a second question after that. So, Jonathan, it tracks the student uh, funding, uh, the 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 uh, state. Uh, share of the funding. I think right now, I don't know the exact number, it's somewhere in excess of $4,000 per student is what the state pays for each student in West Virginia. Uh, the total funding, including local and federal sources, somewhere in excess of 12000 a year. But the HOPE scholarship uh, is uh, directly related to that, that state share of that, of that roughly $12,000, which again is a little over $4,000. So as that number changes each year, the HOPE scholarship tracks that number. Okay, great. And is there a... Um... Is there a finite number or has there been talk of a finite number where once the Hope Scholarship is providing for a certain amount of children in the state that maybe the state education budget for the public schools gets cut back some or how how will that work? I mean, if this program really takes off. 
Well, the, to be clear, the funding for the Hope Scholarship is a separate appropriation by the legislature. Uh, traditional public schools continue to receive uh, the per student allocation based on their enrollment. So as their enrollment goes up, obviously they, they receive uh, additional uh, additional funding. Uh, if their enrollment goes down, a student transfers out of that school either to, uh, to become a Hoop Scholarship student or uh, becomes uh, goes to another school. Again, that, that money essentially follows the student there. But I would uh, just remind folks uh, that uh, – the lion's share of the per student funding that again includes both federal and local dollars uh, that continues to uh, remain in the public school system so of that a little more than twelve thousand dollars we're only talking about roughly a third of that a little over four thousand dollars that 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 uh, follows the student with the hope scholarship the remaining of those dollars those local and federal dollars they remain, they, they remain with the traditional system uh, to, you know, uh, help cover fixed cost and, and other uh, expenses associated with the traditional school system. Paul, we are out of time. I thank you very much for yours. Any final thoughts from you in 30 seconds or so? Well, Leadership Jefferson has been here uh, the last couple of days, so always uh, great to have uh, representatives of our local Chamber of Commerces uh, down here. And I think in a couple of weeks uh, we'll have Leadership Berkeley here. So look forward to seeing those folks. And if anyone else is down here at the Capitol, please reach out to your local, local legislators. We'd love to visit with you. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate you uh, taking care of things this morning for uh, Wally Pipp back there. I'm not giving up my slot. <laughs> Tell them you're in the lineup now, baby. <laughs> Have a great day, guys. You too. Thanks.